Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session this afternoon, Mobile Subjects in Linked Open Data, Biases and Gaps in Identity and, Re and Representation. Our presenters today are Maribel Hidalgo uh, Urbaneja. She is a postdoctoral researcher working on the Worldling Public Cultures Research Project at the University of the Arts London and on the mobile subjects. Uh, Contrapunto Modernism's Research Project at Carleton University in Canada. Her research interests span digital storytelling and narratology in museums and art history, as well as critical digital humanities approaches that seek to challenge and reimagine dominant and biased practices in art history and memory institutions. Our second presenter today is Janneke Van Hova. Um, Janneke is in her first year of studying for her PhD in cultural mediations at Carleton University. Her research is on the international art bank model. Her, sorry, her research on the international art bank model uses data to examine difficult histories in public art collections. Um, thank you. And I will turn it over to uh, Maribel and Janneke. Thank you, Christy. Christy and Maribel, could you nod your head to confirm you can still hear me? Perfect. Thank you. And just a disclaimer to everyone, I have two screens going here. So my script is on this screen. So I apologize for my poor eye contact throughout this presentation. Okay. So Mobile Subjects Contrapuntal Modernisms is a transnational research project led by Professor Ming Champo. Ming and a team of art history, digital humanities, and visual arts researchers, including Maribel and myself, are investigating the circulation of artists from the decolonizing world through the colonial and artistic capitals of London, England, and Paris, France. We examine and compare London and Paris as contrapuntal capitals of decolonizing empires, that functioned as critical meeting places, anti-colonial hubs, and sites of exchange after World War II due to post-war mass migration. This project addresses the invisibility of overseas artists in histories of art through the creation of a relational database and interactive visual data models that will reveal their connections and intersections. Next slide, please. Oh no, I'm, I'm the one running the slides. <laughs> Okay, here we are. <laughs> so this slide shows you who our research team is and how we are structured. This is a digital humanities. There, there is a digital humanities team, a bridge team that connects and informs both teams and a growing team of researchers. Maribel and I work primarily on the data side of the project and we are developing a relational database using Drupal that the research team uses to enter their research. And I'm the one manning the slides, so here we are at the next slide. <laughs> For this project, we are interested in finding and featuring the artists who came from the so-called Global South and contended with barriers related to aspects such as their social, racial, and political identities and their lives as artists in Paris and London. These artists studied in the same schools, showed their work in the same galleries and exhibitions, worked in the same studios, and at times lived together. Overall, identity plays an important role in understanding cross-cultural and artistic exchanges between artists and challenging narratives around artistic influence in the context of modernism. Our data practices present specific challenges due to their heterogeneous nature. The data we are working with has been generously shared with us by scholars who have researched artists who were in Paris and London following World War II for years, while other data sets have an institutional origin. The chart you are looking at lists some of the data sets we are working with. Some focus on a specific geographic region, such as Michelle Hrait's Transatlantic Encounters, which is at the bottom of the chart, which features artists who traveled back and forth between countries in Latin America and Paris. Other data sets, especially those coming from registration records for the Paris Biennale, the Slade School, and Cité Internationale, contain information on artists from many geographic regions. Each data set represents and describes identity in different ways. Many data sets provide country of birth, and we have often seen this used to discuss identity. However, using country of birth to discuss identity is reductive because it ignores important aspects such as racialization and social class. 
An example from our project's research comes from our research assistant, Emmanuel, who found that one of the Latin American artists she was researching because of her country of birth was a member of a wealthy family of plantation owners. So for our project, we want to highlight artists who come from very different experiences as they have not received proper recognition for the roles that they played in the development of modernism across the so-called global north. Okay. So in trying to find a unified approach, we are considering both the affordances of relational databases and linked open data in the ethics of identity representation. Some key affordances that the combination of relational databases and linked open data offer are listed here. As for the ethics of identity and data, as you can imagine, this, pre this presents challenging and complex barriers, which Maribel will be discussing later in the presentation. First, I will describe why and how we are using linked open data in our project. So one of the reasons we decided to adopt linked open data is for the benefits offered in data sharing and interoperability. We believe that by making our data available to the wider community and linked open data ecosystem, we will contribute to the representation of many artists who have been neglected and forgotten by master narratives. One of my roles for this project is to prepare these data sets to be uploaded to our database. This includes reconciling the data in OpenRefine. This summer, I used OpenRefine to reconcile or match artists and artistic groups in our data set with identifiers from two vocabularies, Wikidata and the Getty ULAN. We are also using the Getty vocabularies and VIAF for other aspects of our project data. For example, we can identify specific geographic locations in Paris and London and places of birth and death and describe materials used by artists. In terms of identity, we use a variety of fields, including gender identity, national identity, racial or racialized identity, their social class, their political affiliations or beliefs, and the languages they used. It's important to note that we approach all of this data entry, particularly the components related to identity, with much care and consideration. For example, we are measuring how certain we are of the data we enter, and racial or racialized identity can only be entered with proof of an artist's self-identification. The table we are looking at shows our data sources across the top in our data fields along the side. The final two columns for Wikidata and the Getty vocabularies in the green cells Underneath of them are a general visual indicator of the impact that introducing linked open data to our project had. Linked open data allowed us to expand our existing data sets by pulling additional information for our matched artists and groups that was missing from our original data sets. However, there are still gaps in terms of the data and terminology we can obtain from the Getty vocabularies and Wikidata and especially in terms of how to represent the semantic connections between the data fields using a standardized ontology, such as the CDOC CRM. So Maribel will now discuss the logistics of working with the CDOC CRM and go in depth on the challenges between the CDOC CRM and identity. Okay, thank you, Janaka. Uh, so as Janaka just mentioned, we decided to adopt ICOM's International Committee of Documentation Conceptual Reference Model, known as you know as the CDOC CRM, because it's a well-established and widely used standard to describe cultural heritage in granular detail in the databases of the collections of cultural institutions, as well as in digital projects such as ours. In addition to being used for the descriptions of objects in collections, the event-centric nature of the CDOC CRM can help us represent the connections and encounters of the different artists we study, easily establishing a network of relationships between them that is set in time and space. This is a network of relationships that we will be able to analyze and query through searches in our relational database, as well as through visual data models similar to the one you can see on the slide, which is one of the working prototypes that we expect to implement in our website and our colleague Pansy Atta is, is working on. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, however, our implementation of the CDOC CRM revealed it revealed the limitations of the ontology to express the different layers of identity defining the, the, the artists we study. 
So what you can see on this slide is a schema of our database. On the left-hand side, uh, we have the different data fields that we use for our events that uh, generally are exhibitions or the years of academic study of the different artists with their corresponding CDOCs, CRM classes and properties. And then, and then these events connect different artists who participated uh, in them through different roles. So they were uh, either like artists who were being exhibited in the exhibitions, they were students, they were also teachers uh, at the schools and academies where, where the artists uh, were uh, getting uh, training. Um, also um, gallery, gallery owners. Um, on the right hand side of the slide, there are all the data fields for, for the artists. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, uh, zooming into the, the area to show you where the issue lies more precisely. Uh, I ended up using the same property, which is P107 has current or former member or is current or former member of, and the class E74 group uh, for many of the fields that you see on the screen. Uh, and this include artistic group, educational institution, the galleries, the studio, also for political affiliation and social class. Um, this is something that in some part in particular cases require interpreting the scope notes of the, the property and the class uh, quite broadly and freely, uh, such as in the case of social class that I, I'll explain a little bit later. However, there are important data fields, in particular gender and the racial identity uh, that the artists have been uh, uh, attributed with that either cannot be represented with the current version of the CDOC CRM or require a very complex articulation of the ontology to be expressed through it. There are other data fields that contribute to the construction of identity in the artist's professional practice uh, and therefore identify them on that level that fall out of the scope of the CDOC CRM completely. And these are the disciplines and media that they use in their work. Uh, sometimes they use techniques, disciplines and material that originate in their own cultures and are mixed with Western techniques. Also, uh, we cannot map out uh, how, you know, what languages they spoke. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now I hope you can follow me through this reading of the scope notes. Uh, so as you can find on the CDOC CRM website uh, for P107, which is on the left hand side, it, it's, it explains that it's used to associate persons with groups of people. And then these groups of people are class E74, and you can see uh, the scope node on the, on the right hand side. Uh, and that according to the scope node, uh, these groups are defined as a collective that comprises any gatherings or organizations of human individuals or groups that are collectively or in a similar way due to any form of unifying relationship. And that includes nationalities, couples and families, people who share an ideology or belief, as well as more institutionalized types of organizations. And if you look at the examples, uh, they, they don't include uh, social class. Uh, but we, we, at the moment, we are using a broad interpretation um, to define social class under these parameters. Uh, if you look at the examples under the, the definition on the scope note, uh, we find artistic groups such as the Impressionists, nationalities such as the Greeks, uh, different types of organizations, and even people who share a common ideology, for example, peace protesters. Uh, and while we can see broader conceptual similarities around the idea of acting collectively or in a similar way because of shared ideologies and beliefs, given the nature of our project, we see the need of differentiating types of groups such as artists with the same nationality from artists who belong to an artistic group. We see them as different types of groups, basically. However, the limited scope of P107 and E74 raises questions in terms of the agency of a person has uh, when joining a so-called group. So if you read the scope note of E74 
and go under incoming direct properties, there is a list of actions such as formation, dissolution, joining, and participating. Um, and this can be questioned because what if uh, belonging to a group does not depend on a person's decision of forming, joining, dissolving, or participating in such group? Uh, the CDOC CRM does not differentiate between a third party, for example, another person, a nation state, or an organization assigning a group with a per, uh, um, to a person uh, from when the person decides to form and join this, this group. And this becomes a problem when an art critic, a curator, a cataloger gives a label to a group of artists. Uh, and for example, this happened with one of the uh, examples they include with the Impressionists. They were named after an arts critic satirical review of one of the first exhibitions. And this is quite different from uh, the situation of artists who decide to constitute their own artistic group. Uh, and being labeled and, or assigned to, to a group based on the terms of another rather than their own is precisely a phenomenon that the artists we research in on projects are often subjected to. Uh, next slide, please. Is, oh, okay, sorry. Going back to the database fields that we struggle to model with the CDOC CRM, there are several projects that we have attempted to address this gap um, and propose either extensions of the CDOC CRM or a specific mappings of it. So you can see the schema designed by the Swiss Art Research Infrastructure Project, sorry, uh, that was mapped using the CDOC CRM. However, they extended the CRM, adding a series of specific properties and classes that provide some solutions to some of our problems. Among the extensions proposed, the, there, there is a subclass for the gender attributed to a person, as well as a property for languages spoken by people, which is another field we use in our databases is out of the scope of, of the CDOC CRM at the moment. Also, they have created subclasses for national affiliation, and cultural affiliation that the CDOC CRM does, does not have at the moment. This mapping and its extensions confirm that there is need for graduality and specificity in the projects that, that want to use the CDOC CRM. Then another project that proposes a solution that does, but in this case does not involve extending the ontology is the Orlando project. Given the focus of this project on feminist literary scholarship, it proposes the modeling of gender as a cultural form using different properties and classes from, from the CDOC CRM. And the interesting thing of this model is, it, 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 is that it's guided by the understanding of gender as a social construct that can be expressed in the context of a specific social behavior, which is the attribution of gender. So looking at the diagram on the slide, we can see that the pattern adds two activities or, or events, the ones that you can see on the blue squares, and that would enable the possibility of eventually adding who was involved in the attribution, which is a very important element to, in terms of understanding self-attribution of gender uh, in the current uh, moment. Uh, their very granular modeling of gender identity requires a very deep knowledge of the CDOC CRM, and we think it can present challenges in terms of data entry as well, because it will require to enter data into fields at least. However, given that uh, racial identity of individuals is a social con construct, we could model the racial identities of the artists we have here on database. Uh, with similar mappings to this one. And it, to address all this gap about um, social constructions, the CDOC CRM, uh, in particular the special interest group, is already developing an extension of the ontology called the CRM SOC that will, inter that will integrate data about social phenomena and constructs. And so we hope that it will include the social constructs that we are using in our database, such as gender and social class, uh, as well as the very sensitive issues of uh, racialized identity. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, as you probably expect, we are not the only ones who have encountered barriers trying to implement the CDOC CRM 
in projects. Uh, the limitations of its scope go beyond social con constructivism. And in this slide, we would like to share a number of resources that is not exhaustive, but shows the different areas in which the ontology needs to be revisited to represent the variety of knowledge, leaf experiences, and perspective that exists in our world and society. Several scholars have noted how ontologies and classification systems used by museums need to be expanded to accommodate other ways of knowing and being. The decolonial turn, as well as the feminist and queer theory, inform the critical appraisal of ontologies, including the CEDOC theorem. These limitations and barriers have an impact in different disciplines, including our history and archaeology, and in both institutional databases and scholarly digital projects and resources like ours. Uh, there are also in this list specific projects that have attempted to use the CDOT CRM and have documented the barriers in mapping concepts and ideas that do not originate in Western epistemologies. And in particular, they are focusing on indigenous cultures, emphasizing the work needed to rethink the ontologies we use once again. And last slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so we would like to conclude our presentation by asking some questions as we consider the best way of moving forward. Uh, we, see th we think that these questions are not just for us. And since, man since many of you are involved in similar discussions, we see the need of answering them collectively. Projects like ours, as, as well as other projects we have discussed, show that given the shift in scholarship and GLAMS documentation, we need to expand the CEDOC CRM and other ontologies to include socially constructed identities. This uh, implies the understanding of social constructions and the role that agency and context play in the attributions of gender, racialized identities, and social class. Therefore, uh, the first question we would like to pose is, how can we design properties and classes for socially constructed identities that are tied to specific societal and historical contexts? And how can we best account for agency in the attribution of these identities? This is a matter that should not be decided in isolation by a selected group of people, and it should involve both members of the project as well as respective knowledge experts with leaf experience. And for example, given our cultural and social backgrounds, Jana and I cannot ex speak or make decisions on behalf of all the communities that the artists represented in the database belong to. This applies not only to the ontology, but also that to the terminology we use and, and other elements in our database. And for this reason, we believe that the adoption of participatory and pro-diversal design methods to construct ontologies and extensions of existing or of existing ones is a requirement moving forward. And this is the basis for our second and, and third questions. So when universal ontologies and control vocabularies cannot represent the realities and knowledge we aim to bring into the database, what bottom-up approaches to knowledge production can we use? And then how can these bottom-up approaches help us uh, help make the modeling of the ontology more accessible for users from a variety of background? With this, we end our presentation. We are looking forward to your reflections, feedback, and questions for us. And thank you for listening. Okay. Uh, thank you both for uh, a really interesting uh, presentation. And I just want to invite everyone in the Zoom, um, If you, since uh, Maribel and Yannicka ended the presentation with some discussion present uh, questions, feel free to drop uh, not just questions, but thoughts and comments into the chats. And I believe uh, you can unmute yourself too, if you would like to do that. We did get uh, one uh, non inform well, uh, not content related question in the Slack, but uh, uh, a question about the link to the slides that was shared. Um, that the slides were are a bit different than what was shown in the presentation. So I don't know. 
I haven't verified that myself, but uh, but it, the PDF is a little, the PDF link is maybe a bit different. Well, we also did post two links, and one of them is a list of the links that we shared throughout the presentation, and the other one is the slides. So the only difference I can think of in the slides is that you can't play the data model that Pansy made on Okay. slide six. Yeah. Yeah. We'll double check anyway. If, Yeah, I am double if, checking right now, yeah. and I think it's the exact same as what we've presented, honestly, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, maybe it's the the link in Sked is a little from the Sked is Oh, a little okay. different. So maybe that's the okay that's the issue. Oh, I see. And there's two links. If that was Yes. my fault. Sorry about that. I, I, I grabbed the one and then I was like, oh, I got an error with the other one. But there was they were trying in my browser trying to look at two at the same time. So that all makes sense now. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. And Um, one comment that I had, um, I don't, I didn't, you know, I've been kind of, uh, as one of the co-chairs, I'm kind of always a little half in and half out of the presentations as I'm responding to emails and messages. But um, some of your discussion questions made me think of a project that I had seen a presentation on a few years ago that I believe is still active called the Gender and Sexuality Studies Ontology. Um, and... Um, Yeah, I, I, I thought, I remember at the time thinking that it, it did have sort of a, an interesting model where it would for like, because within like the queer community, some terms are, or just a lot of uh, socially constructed communities, there's a lot of um, sometimes like people's preferred terms um, will change over time or the terms that are preferred by the community kind of change over time. And Some people change with the times and some people don't. And they had kind of constructed a model that tried to address that. I was, so I was wondering if you had, uh, if that work, uh, if you were aware of that and if uh, that had informed your project at all. Um, I, well, I'm going to, I'm going to answer and maybe Janaka has something to say after, after myself. So, yeah, so that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I mean, in our case, uh, I guess because most of the artists we're studying, they are not already, uh, I mean, they are not alive. Uh, we are dealing with, um, historical data, Um, we, I mean, uh, we, we have issues, for example, with, um, citizenship and countries, uh, that have changed their names, uh, uh, yeah. And, and, um, you know, frontiers that have also moved and, and situations like that. Um, so I don't, we don't, I, um, I cannot think of any examples of situations where we have sort of like some of these identities and group is cha changing over time. But uh, if we have that, perhaps we need to also represent that type of information in, our, in the database. If we are trying to do it with the CDOC CRM model, which is always connected to an event and time and space, I think it, it, it could, it, I mean, it could get like, quite complex to represent but if if we want to be like that accurate that would be like the way of doing it I think and and of course like also thinking about the attribution um I mean in our cases uh yeah we are thinking about yeah we are thinking about like negotiating um the situation where we have artists who maybe have been labeled in some ways uh and other artists whom we might have the documentation of them sort of like making a statement about about their I don't know their gender their racial identities and and other types of um you know, so, sort of like elements or or I don't know or even social class so yeah we'll see how we can represent that but yeah it's um it's an interesting question yeah one example that I can think of from the world in public cultures project is an institution that changed names over time, it, it used to be First Nations University and it changed names and we wanted to reflect that nuance in our place names that we were entering into the database. So for that instance, we have name iterations under place names where you can enter the multiple names that a place has had over time and it's still tied to the same location. So it will come up as 
the same location. And another way that we are capturing nuance like that is in researcher work notes that are attached to the forms that we have for entering data. So a lot of detail such as ambiguity around dates is not something that can be squeezed into these static forms that are used to that that are needed to be able to make models using the technologies. So we have researcher work notes where our researchers can make can can put that information that isn't something that fits into the other fields that we have in the form. So we're not disregarding that information. We're just keeping track of it in a different way. And there's a question in the chat too, Mirabel. Did you see that one coming? Oh no, it's not doing this. Okay. So, or it's a long comment. <laughs> yes, and um, and Mara, if you feel uh, Mar Mara has is kind of um has helped uh, with uh, some of the conference sessions as part of the program committee and uh, involved with the LD4, um, a Wikidata group. So Mara, would you like to unmute and share and speak a bit more? Um, no, no worries if not. Sure, I can, Timothy. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, so my comment, I'll mostly just read it, but um, I said, I'm part of the Black Bibliography Project. And uh, you know, as you might imagine, we talk quite often about how to mark um, racial or racialized subjects in our database. And I am, I'm really interested in the idea of gender events and by extension, race events that have, um, that sort of give attribution to the person perceiving the race or the gender at that moment. Um, and it makes me think of uh, it makes me think of the fennel um, hailing sort of uh, theory, uh, theoretical work, um, and it it feels really um, rich and valuable. Um, just off the top of my head, I was thinking that if you have such a model and there are multiple events for, you know, there are multiple race or gender events um, that. I think one of the things that I would want to see would be a way to uh, hierarchicalize those events in order to not sort of flatten out um, or have at the same sort of level of data self-identification and um, perception by external um, sources. But I, I'm really... I'm really into this idea, and I think this is something I could take back and and use conceptually in my own work. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the for the comment. Yeah, we. No, I mean it's it's quite interesting to see all the suggestions because I mean also uh, you know like our final questions were also about like how can we do all of these together? <laughs> all the groups are we are interested in the same um, in solving the same issues. So. Yeah, it's quite a yeah, quite an inspiring yeah suggestion. Thank you. And I see there's a comment from uh, Maria Flores, uh, Maria Laura Flores Barba, um, and Maria is going to give a talk. Describes uh, a project that she's working on, and I just wanted to note that uh, she will give a talk on Wednesday uh, during the uh, lightning blocks and the uh, lightning talks in the morning, starting at ten forty five. But I'd also like to invite Maria, if you'd like to unmute and talk about this a little bit, um, uh, talk, you know, feel free. Otherwise, we can read your comment out loud. Yes, thank you. And thank you for uh, saying about my presentation on Wednesday. Yes, I am. I have a very similar project to yours, but with uh, painters in colonial Mexico. And um what I so my database is basically linked to sources. So what I I always kept like the source uh, with with the information that I um, used, and of course there was uh, instances in which a person was declared as a mestizo and then as a español or as like a, a mulatto in different sources. So I had to keep track of that as well, and I kind of. Um, thought of the race or the case as an event, not as a property of the of the person. And I also, I had a question with your um, model. Uh, I, when you say that you, well, when you consider the um, media that the artist works with, uh, I would, 
understand the media as because I also uh, used objects in my database. So art uh, actors and artifacts, right? So the artifacts go uh, have the properties of technique and medium or whatever, but not the actors. So I, but like in general, we know that artists work in a specific medium, but sometimes I don't know how the, um, well, that's my question. How, how was the logic behind that uh, decision about your model? Yeah, so, so it was, I mean, it was more about like simplifying the um, sort of data entry rather than following uh, strictly the CDOC CRM, because of course we will have to um, link objects to, to, the, to the RCs. Uh, also, some of the database co co confirmed this, Janaka, if, uh, um, uh, if I remember, they were um, they were just like in, in a very general way, sort of like um, giving, sort of like connecting people with techniques. So it was like a way of or sort of like classifying or, uh, the, the artists. Um, um, because I guess, I mean, some of these databases come from, from schools and... And this is like, um, I mean, basically they were like sort of like organized around, uh, I guess, the the techniques they use, the also the materials they use and things like that. But but yeah, it's like, it, but definitely, the, I mean, the right way will be like, what do you, you know, like the one that you are using, which is like connecting uh, the artist to the artworks. Um, but because we are like entering the data in the way we are entering it and also we are like focusing more in on the intersections between actors. We sort of like prioritize that way of entering data. Um, but yeah, this is definitely, um, I think your way is like the right way of doing it, even though it's like, it's, I, I mean, I, I, I imagine it's quite complex in terms of data entry and everything. But yeah, and, and I, yeah, and I find your project, like I'll, I'll try to, to watch it if, I mean, I'm teaching some seminars, but hopefully I can find some time um to watch your presentation because it sounds like a very fascinating thing and i mean also to say that um i mean i'm i'm from spain uh but you know some of like so i'm sort of like aware with all the issues around racialization in latin america and i feel like in our database we are having i mean it it, it was exactly i mean the 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 artists we started to have issues with was an artist that is you know, consider a uh, South American, but then uh, we realized that his ancestry was European. And very often we see like this uh, sort of like classification or racialization, or well, mo more like ethnicity of artists, like, oh, they are all Latin American artists, but there is a lot of, a lot to unpack in terms of, um, I mean, colonization and the effects of the coloniz of colonization there. And also, um, you know, all these phenomenon like the, you know, the castas in, and all these things in Mexico. So, so yeah, I'm really, yeah, I'm really curious about what you're doing. <laughs>